Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT study guide, GMAT official guide rather, 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we will solve some multiple choice problems that you will find on page number 79. Turn to it, make sure the book is in front of you. Page number 79, the very first problem that you find here is problem number 110. As you can see, the problem is already on the blackboard. Let's take a, let's, let's take a look at it. At the end of the video, if you find this helpful and if you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can reach me at Kishwani Prep. This P R E P Kashwani Prep at iCloud.com. All right, let's begin, shall we? The very first problem is a very straightforward problem. We are told that we have some operation theta, some operation theta, which is defined as A B C, and then the operation D E F, and we and we are told what the operation requires. What it, what it requires is a simple product, simple product of the of the corresponding quantity, A times D, B times E and c times f you get the idea and the question is question is what's the value of this quantity what's the value of this quantity let's find out shall we so we have 1 times 1 1 times 1 plus negative 2 times negative half plus 3 times 1 third there we go that's all it is 1 times 1 is just 1 negative 2 and 2 is going to cancel out and this negative and this negative will become positive 1 and these three is going to cancel out and that's also a positive one. The answer is three. This quantity is equal to three. Number 111. As I told you before many times, some of them are just too silly. Number 111. It says M and P are positive integers. They both have to be positive. And we are further told that m squared plus p squared has to be less than 100. Has to be less than 100. We have to satisfy, we must satisfy this condition. The question simply is, what is the, what is the greatest possible possible value of m times p, their product. What is the greatest possible value of m times p, keeping in mind that we must satisfy this, this condition that m squared plus p squared must be less than 100. And since the answer choice is given to us, that makes it easier. a says 36, b says 42, c says 48, D says 49 and E says 51. Let's begin, shall we? Let's begin. As you can see, we have 36 here. 36 can, can easily be written as 6 times 6. In other words, they are both 6s. We know it cannot be. There are, there are other possibilities, obviously. There are other possibilities. M and P are positive integers. They can, there are other whole numbers. For example, it could have been 2 times 18 or it could have been 3 times 12. But 2 times 18 or 3 times 12 is not going to work because 12 square alone is more than 100. Forget about 12 square plus 3 squared. But remember, there's the square, some of their square has to be less than 100. So m and p cannot be 3 and 12, nor, nor can they be 2 and 18. That's why 6 and 6. So that's one possibility. Because if 6 and 6 is just simply, let's not write it as square equal to, it's just 6 squared plus 6 squared, 6 squared plus 6 squared, which is going to give us 30, 72, and that works. The question is, is this the biggest one that we can find? Let's continue. There is another one. Seven, seven squared, seven squared, seven times six is what we're looking at. Seven times, seven times, seven, six of 42. Seven squared plus six squared, let's see what that gives us. 49 plus 36, 49 plus 36. 36 plus 50 would have been 86, so it's gonna be 85. Oh, there you go, this is even bigger than that one. That means A is definitely not the answer because we already found something bigger. 48, how can we write 48? 48 can be written as 
Uh, six eights. Six eights are 48. Six eights are 48. We're not going to put the multiplication sign because I want to write it in this form to show that it is less than 100. This is less than 100. That was less than 100. 6 squared plus 8 squared. If you add them up, you will see that it equals 100. And we are told that the quantity has to be less than 100. The sum of this quantity, the square of these two quantities, has to be less than 100. And that is 100 is not less than 100. C would not work. We crossed out C not because it is not one of the largest one, because it doesn't work. It just simply doesn't work. Same thing is going to happen here. I hope you are able to see that this, when you divide by 3, we know we can divide 51 by 3 because 5 plus 1 is 6. And since the sum of the digits is divisible by 3, 51 is divisible by 3. 51 is not a prime number. If you divide by 3, here let's divide by 3, see what happens. 5 has 1, 3. 5 has 1, 3. After we take away 3 from the 5, we have a remainder of 2. 2 goes and joins the 1, it becomes 21. And 21 has 7, 3. In other words, 51. In other words, is 51 is 17, 17 and 3. I'm not, again, I'm not going to put down the multiplication sign, but 17 and 3. It's not going to work because 17 squared plus 3 squared is not going to be less than 100. So, E does not work because the numbers are just too large. C does not work because it is exactly equal to 100. It's going to be less than 100. It had to be either A, B or D. A is gone because A is smaller than B. Let's see what D says. So, D would work because it is simply 7 squared plus 7 squared. 7 times 7 is 49. And that's going to give us 98. And 98 is the biggest one that we found because the next, next one next one in line is 85. 98 is the biggest sum that we can... What's the, what is the greatest possible value of, uh, of, uh, of the product? The answer is 49 is the biggest possible value. Keeping in mind that we want to... The sum of the squares of the two quantities has to be less than 100. So as, we, as, as close to 100 as we can get is 98. In which case it will be... The biggest we can get is 49 which is simply 7 times 7. Now personally, I do not like this problem. I do not like it at all. Because I think what happened was, some idiot was told that you have to come up with 5 problems today before you leave your office today. And he couldn't come up with anything. And in a hurry, he put this together. Because I hate the idea that M and P are the same thing. This is very misleading. This is very deceiving. Even though the problem does not say that they cannot be same, I understand that. I still just don't like it. It's just too dirty for me. It's just a bit too dirty for my taste. That's what it turned out that both M and P are 7. But one would assume that if you're using different symbols, that there'll be different values. But you know, such is life. What can you say? 112. 112. One twelve says that if if x over y is equal to c over d and d over c is equal to b over a, then which of the which of the following must be True, something that has to be true all the time. Before we look at the three statements, they give us three statements, one, two, and three statements. Before we look at the three statements, let's work on it a little bit. You see, here we have C over D, here we have C over D, and here we have D over C. So let's work on this guy. Let's work on this guy. If we take the reciprocal of it, C over D from this is simply A over B. It becomes A over B. And now we know, we are told that X over Y equals C over D, and C over D we also know equals A over B, which means what we are dealing with is this. Essentially, this is what is given to us. This is what is given to us. Now we can look at the, now we can look at the statements. The first statement tells us that Y over X is equal to B over A. Let's see if we can find Y over X. Here is X over Y. There you go. X over Y is A over B. If x over y is a over b, then y over x is the reciprocal of it, must be b over a. That one works. That one, just, that one does the job nicely. We don't have to do really anything at all. The statement 2 says, 112, let's see what statement 2 says. Statement 2 says x over a, 
x over a equals equals y over b y over b let's see what we can do here somehow we have to get x over a out of it well there we go right here from here you see x over y equals a over b let's let's write let's let's write this down here down here so we can see it x over y x over y equals a over b now if you, if you cross multiply if you cross multiply bring the a down here and bring the y on the top that is going to give us x over a equals y over b voila which is exactly what that is which means statement two is also true this statement two is also true let's see what we get in this statement three statement three says statement three says y over a y over a is equal to x over b x over b x over b let's see if we can get either x over b out of this thing or y over a y over a it is not going to work you see look y is here y is here and a is on the top when you cross multiply they're going to switch places we're not going to get one over the other and x over b it's just not going to work let's put we had them here let's erase this part we are, we are done with this thing let's erase this thing we don't need it anymore See the thing that deals with y over a, y and a and x and b, x and b are these two, this one and that one. Let's write them down here. It tells us that x over y, x over y is equal to a over b. This is what is given to us. A over b. It's just not going to work. There is no way we can get y times a equals x times b. And what this says is that y times b equals x times a. This one tells us that x times b equals a times y. This says, this says x times b equals a times y. And this is not the same thing. This is not the same thing. This statement is not true. The answer is which of the following statements are which of the following statements must be true? The answer is only, only one and two only one and two and there is answer choice there is answer choice c i don't know why i see the need to babysit you obviously you can figure out which answer choice that one is 113 113 113 says k is an integer k is an integer and and we are told and 0 0.0025 times 0 0.025 times 0 0.0025 times k 10 raised to k we are told that this quantity is an integer. It's a whole number. This quantity has to be integer. The question simply is what is the least possible value of k? What is the least least possible value of k? Let's find out, shall we? Let's erase all of this thing. The least possible value of k, well, this 0 0.0025, since it has four decimal places, one, two, three, four, it can be written as 25 over 10 raised to four. Similarly, this guy can be written as 25 over one, two, three, 10 raised to three. And similarly, this guy can be written as one, two, three, four, five, 25 over 10 raised to five times 10 raised to k. Now, we, uh, now as we clearly see, as we can clearly see that 25 times 25 times 25 is a whole number, it's an integer. So that part is already done. We simply have to get rid of this thing with that thing. Let's see how many exponents we need to get rid of this, this quantity on the top. 4 plus 3 is 7, 7 plus 5 is 12. There you go. If k is equal to 12, 
if k if k equal, if k is equal to 12 and that's the smallest value that k can assume it can be it can be 13 14 15 but if k is equal to 12 it will take you know it will knock down everything and therefore the whole thing will be an integer the answer is what is the least possible value of k the answer is 12 now notice the reason why it is 12 i want you, i want to make sure that you understand okay pay attention here very Reason why it is so simple, reason why it is simple, we don't have to do anything else. As a matter of fact, if you like, we can do one quick example that is not in the book to show you that sometimes you have to do an extra step. Here we don't have to do anything else, we're done here. And the reason is because if you look at the unit digit, if you look at the unit digit, 5 times 5 is 25. So 25 times 25 ends in a 5. Obviously it ends in a 5, it's 625. And then that quantity is 625 or 5. Again, if you multiply it by 25, it again ends in a it again ends in a 5. It does not end in a 0. 25 times 25 times 25 is not a multiple of 10. And therefore, that is the smallest value of k. We cannot, out, we cannot take away any other, any other uh, exponent of 10 from here. This is it. Let's look at one more. Let's look at one more. This is a different one. Let's call it 113b. m is an integer and... and... let's make it very simple this quantity times times 10 raised to m is an integer what is the least possible value of m what is the least possible value of m pause the video i would like you to pause the video and do it yourself see if, see what you can come up with now pause the video i'll give you Alright, so as you can see this work is already here, that work is already here, we just have to get rid of this thing, we just have to get rid of this thing and put a 4 here, because that is 4. And this is 10 raised to 4, this is 10 raised to 4 and this is 10 raised to 3. What's going to happen here is, we cannot, we cannot jump our gun and say that 4 plus 3 is, 4 plus 3 is, and again we have 10 raised to m here. We cannot say that to get rid of this thing, 10 raised to m, to get rid of 10 raised to m, we just need a power of 7. We cannot say that m does not equal, but the smallest value of m is not 7. This is, this, is not the, this is not the least. This is not the least. The reason why it is not the least, because here, after we finish doing everything, what we have to understand is that 25 times 4 is 100. 25 times 4 of 4 is 100, so what we find on the top is 25, this 25, times 100, and then we have all of this thing. So 10 raised to 4 and 10 raised to 3. And this is 10 raised to 2. And we can knock out one exponent here. This just becomes 10. So here the smallest value of m that we need to make this quantity an integer is not 7, but it is 5. It, it is 4 rather. It should have been it's 5. That's right. It should have been 5 because we just knocked out 2. We knocked out 2. It, it was 7 before and we knocked out two zeros here. So it's four and one five but we did not have to do that extra step in the problem that we just finished because it wasn't a multiple of 10 25 times 25 times 25 does not end in a zero but there is something there is something we must keep in mind because it does happen in the exam it does happen in the exam where after you finish where after you finish doing the bloody thing you have to do that one extra step next one Number 14, it says if a times a plus 2 equals 24 and b times b plus 2 also equals 24 and, and we are told that a cannot equal b then then what's the value of a plus b the condition is that a and b are distinct quantities they are not equal to each other in that case what's the value of a plus b what's the value of a plus b now here if you wanted to if you wanted to tackle it in a very traditional way a very orthodox way a very classical way a very geeky very nerdy very algebraic way you could you could turn this you could turn this into a bloody you could turn this into a bloody quadratic equation a squared plus 2a 
minus 24 equals 24 and uh, minus 24 equals 0 and you can do that and figure out the roots and all that but you don't have to do that don't don't do that you're just going to create you're just going to create unnecessary headache it can be done that way obviously but it's not necessary it's very easy it's very simple look it's 24 it's just 6 times 4 or rather 4 times 6 rather 4 times 6 because a is equal to 4 4 plus 2 is 6 and it gives you 24 the problem here is that here also b times b plus 2 is 24 but a and b cannot be the same a and b cannot be the same well that's a very simple solution then if 3 times 4 is 3 times 4 is 12 then so is negative 3 times negative 4 now they are not the same so let's do that instead of 4 and 6 we can have this but you see this this is not going to work this is not going to work the reason why it's not going to work is because if pay attention here if b is negative 4 the negative 4 plus 2 is not negative 6 so the only thing that we need to do here pay, that's why we have to pay attention otherwise otherwise the sum is going to be different because we are looking for a plus b remember we are looking for a plus b so we have to pay attention so the only thing that we need to do here is switch them this is not going to work b is equal to negative 6 b is equal to negative 6 you see b is equal to negative 6 plus 2 now it works now it works beautifully b is negative 6 and negative 6 plus 2 is going to give us negative 4 and negative 4 times negative 6 is 24 and the question simply was how much is a plus b how much is a plus b well a is 4 and b is negative 6 and therefore their sum is negative 2 their sum is negative 2 115 115 says the distance from origin to point four five is same as which of the following five points that they give us there are five points that they're giving us five pair of points rather and question is the distance distance between these five pair of points shows the same distance which one of those five shows the same distance as this guy let's find out first for this guy from origin to four five from origin Two, four, five. Well, we have to use what is known as the distance formula. We can either do zero times four or four times four, or zero minus four or four minus zero. Same thing. It's just four squared plus five squared, which is simply sixteen plus twenty-five. We're just going to leave it like this. Even this part was not necessary. Even even this part was not necessary. Let's get going, shall we? Let's get going. The first one says. A says. From negative 3, 2 to negative 7, 8. So it's going to be negative 3 minus a negative 7. That is squared, and then 2 minus 8 squared. Okay. And that becomes a plus. It becomes negative 3 and a positive, positive 7. Negative 3 and positive 7 is 4. 4 squared is 16. 16 plus, and this is 2 minus 6. 2 minus 8 is 6, which is 36. As you can see, this is not same as that. That is not same as that. We have the 16, but instead of, 20, instead of 25, we have 36. Answer is not A. Next one says, let's do the B a little bit on the top. It's not A. B says, negative 2, 1, 2, 3, 5. Again, it is going to be negative 2 minus a 3 squared plus 1 minus 5 squared. Negative 2 minus 3 is negative 5. Negative 5 squared is 25 plus 1 minus 5 is 4. 4 squared is 16. Voila. The answer is B. The answer is B. That's all. Now, if you like, you can go through all the others and you will see that the others don't work. Okay? The last thing I want to talk about here 
last thing very quickly and I don't know why I have this urge to talk about it I hope that you understand that what we just used here I refer to it as a as a distance formula I hope that you're able to see I hope that you're able to understand intuitively the distance from this so-called distance formula is just It's just Pythagorean theorem incognito. It's just an application of Pythagorean theorem. That's all it is, the so-called distance formula. And we can actually show it here. We can actually show it that it's nothing more than application of simple Pythagorean theorem. Let's do it here. We'll, you'll see in a second. Very quickly, okay? So here we go. So we're going to go negative 2, 1 and up to 3 and 5. So let's do 5 up here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 3. 1, 2, 3. 3 and 5 right here. Let's call this point P and let's call this point Q. So this is our point Q which is 3 and 5. And this is negative 2 and 1. Negative 2 and 1 right here. And this is our point P. And what we're trying to figure out is this distance. And the geometry teacher always make a big fuss about it that oh my god now we have to use Pythagorean oh my god we now we have to use distance formula as if as if distance formula is some new animal and therefore we have to learn something new no if you've already learned Pythagorean theorem distance formula is Pythagorean theorem it's one and the same there is no difference you will see here right here this is the distance we're trying to figure out and what it does is that it, it forms a right angle triangle right here it forms a right angle triangle right here the coordinates of P were negative 2 and 1. So here, this distance here, is the Y is going to be the same as 1. And this one was 3, 5. So this is going to be 3 and negative 1. You can see that. Same Y coordinate and same X coordinate, 3 and 1. You with me? Now the distance from 5, this should be 1. From distance from 5 to 1 is 4. 5 to 1 is 4. And to find the distance, and to find that distance, you can either do 5 minus 1 or 1 minus 5. It doesn't matter because the quantity is being squared. If we do 1 minus 5, it's just going to be negative 4. Negative 4 squared is same as positive 4 squared. So that's a 4 squared here. And from here, negative 2 to 3 is a distance of 5. Is a distance of 5. And how do we get that? You can either do negative 2 minus negative 3, in which case it will be negative 5, and you square it. Same thing as 5 squared. Or you can do 3 minus a negative 2. And once we have that, we call this side x here in the path you traditionally the unknown quantity and therefore x squared will simply be 4 squared plus 5 squared but since we are not looking for x therefore we have to take the square root of it but as you can see that is what Pythagorean theorem is that is what Pythagorean theorem tells us and that is the distance formula it is the exact same thing no different they are not two different animals Stop calling it, stop making it so mysterious. 116. Because many a time when I'm teaching kids, and when I say kids, because I also do prep course for the SAT, and many a times when I'm teaching these kids, they proudly tell me that, yes, I do know the Pythagorean theorem, because first, it, but when they're doing it, they, they tell me that I can't remember the distance formula. I, I can't remember how it is. And I ask them how it goes. And I ask them, do you know what the Pythagorean theorem is? And they probably tell me, yes, I do know Pythagorean theorem, but I can't remember the distance formula. And the reason they cannot remember it is because they call, keep calling the bloody thing formula, making it mysterious, something you have to memorize, something you have to remember. No, it's the same thing. Number 16. It says R, some person R, received 8,000, 8,000, In case you're curious about this word, why I put it in the capital letter, word incognito, it's a vocabulary word. I'm, I'm looking in my, in my cards here, just give me one second here. Yes, number 42. Vocabulary, day 42. We learned this word incognito in our vocabulary lessons. In case you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in GMAT vocabulary words, day 42, and watch that video. And if you can't find it, type in my name with it, Keshwani, and then GMAT vocabulary words, day 42, and watch that video. You will learn this word, and you will learn several other words. It doesn't hurt to improve vocabulary. Do you understand? We are told that this person received 8,000 independent 
root. And I'll explain that thing in a second what that means. Plus 10% of party affiliated votes. We are told the total number of votes, n is the total number of votes in the election. And we are told that out of the total n number of votes that were, that were cast, we are told that 40 of them, 40% rather, were independent and 60% were party affiliated. 40 of them were party So those of, who, those of you obviously watching this thing who are in the US, you, you quite understand what this means, but for, those, for the benefit of those people who, who might be watching this thing outside the US, because I know some, some people outside the US also watch my video, in the US when we do voting, is voting is coming up in, in a few weeks, in three, four weeks, uh, we have a system where you have to register to vote, and when you register to vote, you have to declare there are two major parties, Democrats and Republicans. You have to register to vote. When you register to vote, you have to declare, am I a Democrat or am I a Republican? Or you can say, I'm neither. I'm independent. And those are called independent voters. They are not affiliated with any party. You see? 10% of the party affiliated votes. So this person, this, this person who is running for the office, received 8% of the independent votes, people who did not affiliate with either, either party. And she also received 10% of the party affiliated votes. Total number of votes that were cast, we are told, is N out of which we are told that 40% of them were independent voters and 60% of them are party affiliated. We still haven't answered the question. The question is, R received how many votes? R received how many votes? Let's find out. Where can we do it? The question is, this, this quantity, how many votes does she receive? Let's do it here. R received how many votes? Well, we know R received 8,000 votes, we are told here, she received 8,000 of the independent vote. This is the independent vote. But then we are further told that she received 10% of party affiliated votes. 10% of party affiliated vote, we know 40% of N, 40% of, or rather 60% of N, 60% of the N, 60% of the vote were party affiliated. And she received out of the 60%, out of the 60%, she received 10%. In other words, she received 8,000 plus plus 10 percent, 10 percent of 60 percent of n. I don't like it the way it's coming out. I'm going to rewrite it here because it's getting too crowded. So the number of votes that she received was 8,000 which are the independent votes plus she received 10 percent of 60 percent, 60 percent Of N. There we go. That's what it is. And this is this is the party affiliated. That's what it is. We just have to we just have to simplify it now. We just have to simplify it. Let's do it together. Ten percent can be written as one over ten. Off means times. Sixty percent is six over ten. Off means times and n. Now as you can see here, we have a ten times ten, which is hundred. So it's just six over one hundred times n and 6 over 100 is just 6 percent. 6 percent of n. She received 6 percent of the total votes. 6 percent of the total votes plus 8,000. That is the number of votes that she received. That's all. And that's answer choice E. Was that the end of the page? 116. No, there is one more. There is one more. Let's do it together. 117. And God knows how long the video is by now. In 117 we are told that profit is equal to income 
minus cost P is equal to I minus C we are told and then we are told that for for each for each of the for each of the for each of the first four months for each of the first four months we were told the C equals I plus 32 then we are told then we are told that for the next for the next three months for the next three months I equals C plus 36 and for the last last five months and for the last five months we are told I equals C plus 10 the question simply is what is what's the what's the total profit for the whole year what is the total profit for the whole year let's find out shall we okay let's find out let's do it here the very first thing we need to do before we do anything else the very first thing we have to understand is that these three equations are not in the same form let's put all of them in this form the form that they tell us because we look at, we are interested in the profit we are interested in the profit Let, let's express the profit in terms of income and cost let's begin so this tells us this tells us that we're going to write it in this form we need we need to have i minus c so let's bring the c to this side i minus c and bring 32 to here when we bring 32 to here it becomes negative what this gives us is negative 32 equals i minus c for the first four months, for the first four months, for each of those four months, for each of those four months, this is what happened. And what happened here is we are losing money. We are losing $32,000 every month. In the first four months, this equation tells us that we lost $32,000 every month for the first four months. Next three months, this is the situation. Next three months, the situation is I minus C. So 36 equals I minus C. So for the next three months, for the next three months, we had a profit. We had a profit of thirty-six thousand dollars for three months each month. For each month, as I keep emphasizing, this is not for the entire three months. For each month, and for the last month, we have ten equals I minus C. So what this tells us is that we made a ten thousand dollar profit for each of the five months. And now we can figure out the total profit on the top. total profit on the top let's find it out so we have for the first four months we are losing money we are losing 32 32 dollars every four months every month for the four months i meant to say every month for the four months then for the next three months for the next three months we were making 36 thousand dollars every month and for the last five months and for the last five months apparently we made ten thousand dollars every month let's see what that adds up to shall we let's find out Let's start from the easy part, so that's just 50, and here 30 times 3, I know 30 times 3 is 90, and I also know that 3, 6, 18, 3, 6, 18, 18 plus 90, 18 plus 90, 18 plus, 18 plus 90, 90 plus 18, 90 plus 10 is 100, so it's 108. So I took the 18 and I broke it up into 10 and an 8, and 10 plus 90 would be 100 and 8, so that's very easy. Let's figure out this part. 40 times 3, 40 times 3 is 120. 120 and 4, 4 times 2 is 8. So it's negative 128. That's it. All you have to do is figure out what they are up to. Where should we do it? Let's do it right here. Let's do it right here. Or oh, better yet, let's do it right here. 108 plus 50 is 158. And then minus 128. This is very simple. The numbers are very nice. There we go. It turns out that for the whole year, for the entire year, this firm made a measly profit of $30,000. That's it, for the whole year. That was the end of the page. That was the end of the page. Thank God we arrived here finally. We'll meet again tomorrow and we'll do some data sufficiency problems where we left, we're going to pick, we are going to pick up where we left off yesterday. All right, we'll do some data sufficiency problems. If you want to get hold of me, if you would like to me to, if you like to me to help you prepare for the exam, if you would like to work with me, 
You can reach me at Kishwani Prep at iCloud.com. All right. Bye now. And now I'm going to see in the back how long the video has been. Only God knows.